Welcome to the 33rd session of the International IVF Initiative, or I3. I'm Marlene Engel, one of your moderators for today's session entitled Sperm Function. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Mary Mahoney, who may be familiar to many of you from her days at the Jones Institute in Norfolk, Virginia, or through her role as Vice President of Fertility and Endocrinology, North American Medical Affairs, for many years at EMD Serono, a business of Merck KGAA. Mary, welcome. Thank you, Marlene. It's a pleasure to be here today and to participate in this uh, important session. Nice to have you. All right, our speakers today, uh, there are two of them and they represent industry through Dr. Saib and academia via Dr. Aiken. We're delighted to welcome both of them to our webinar series. Behind the scenes, we have the usual and impressive I3 team whose commitment to this webinar has uh, truly astounded me. I don't know how all of them have the time to work at the bench now that most of us are back in our labs, as well as do all of the tasks required to put these webinars together. I'm, I'm amazed, but thanks to all of you. Please note that questions to the speakers, I think most people are aware of this by now, but questions to the speakers must be asked through the Q&A feature. Uh, please do not use the chat function for questions as our panelists will not be responding to questions asked on the chat. Submitted questions to the Q&A will be answered either verbally by the speakers or in writing by the panelists, either today or after the session. Answers will be posted on the website. In addition, please do not use the Q&A session for solicitation for your products or company. And here to introduce our first speaker is Dr. Mahoney. Thank you, Marlene. Hello, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kathleen Zaib. Dr. Zaib is currently Vice President of Research and a member of the senior leadership team at Ohana Biosciences. In this role, she is leading a team that takes a molecule or molecules through the crucial first phase of research, which when completed and only when completed, may the molecule move into clinical studies and ultimately to the laboratory bench uh, or to the clinic. As importantly, if not more importantly, she leads the identification of new target molecules. Having myself been in biopharma for many years, I can tell you that to reach this role requires not only the strongest scientific foundation, but also excellent leadership skills to guide and inspire her team and good business acumen so she can react, interact with all of the team members at Ohana Biosciences. I would also recommend you read Dr. Seib's bio on the I3 website, as it shows she's truly a scientist at heart, having led both basic and translational research efforts for multiple small molecules across a number of disease states. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Saib to the International IVF Initiative webinar. Dr. Saib. Thank you, Mary. I, I'd like to start today by thanking the organizers of this International IVF Initiative. Um, my colleagues and I have really enjoyed the webinar series and found each session really just so informative. This is a really great resource for everyone working in the field, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to introduce Ohana to you at this forum. The focus of my talk today will be on our research into optimizing sperm metabolism to improve sperm function in ART. But I'd like to start by taking a couple of minutes just to tell you who we are at Ohana Biosciences. Ohana was founded in 2016 by a venture firm called Flagship Pioneering, and the goal of the company was to develop new approaches to health and medicine, leveraging sperm biology. Sperm function and biology are critical in reproduction and can impact beyond just fertilization and delivering paternal DNA into the oocyte. 
Ohana's sperm biology platform applies cutting edge experimental and computational approaches to interrogate sperm biology at a single cell level, recognizing that while there are millions of sperm in an ejaculate, only one fertilizes the egg. More and more data indicates that that one sperm can have influence, can influence embryo development, pregnancy outcomes, and even the health of the child. We also recognize that conception and contraception are two sides of the same coin. And sperm biology offers a unique opportunity to develop safe and effective non-hormonal contraception for both men and women. By combining a focus on sperm biology with a drug hunter mindset, Ohana is uniquely positioned to develop antibody-based non-hormonal contraceptives. So that's the big picture of who we are as a team. Um, but today the focus of my talk is gonna be on our fertility programs. And our sperm biology platform has already yielded some interesting insights into the heterogeneity of sperm and the impact that optimized activation of sperm can have beyond fertilization on embryo development and live birth rates in mouse models. These insights enable us to develop novel sperm-based products to improve reproductive outcomes. Our lead program is focused on maximizing sperm capacitation for use in ART. As many of you are aware, sperm have to be activated in order to fertilize the egg. Sperm preparation for ART today involves isolating modal sperm from seminal fluid and resuspending it in media based on human tubal fluid. Yet we know that during natural conception, sperm capacitation occurs in stages as the sperm travel through the female reproductive tract, culminating in a fully capacitated sperm as it gets close to the cumulus oocyte complex. One feature of this activation is a hyperactive motility pattern, which enables the sperm to penetrate the layer of cumulus cells surrounding the egg and bind to and penetrate the zona pellucida for fertilization. One key aspect of capacitation is sperm metabolism. Sperm rely on both glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation as they travel through the female reproductive tract and undergo capacitation and can shift between these metabolic pathways based on the availability of energy sources. Activation of specific pathways may be necessary for different stages of capacitation. With our sperm treatment, we sequentially activate these metabolic pathways increasing the percentage of sperm that fully capacitate as measured by hyperactivation. So leveraging that understanding of sperm biology and how metabolic pathways influence activation, we developed an ex vivo sperm treatment for use in IVF and IUI, recognizing that the ideal activation state of the sperm is different for each procedure. For IVF, Modal sperm are isolated from seminal fluid by swim up or density gradient centrifugation and then incubated for one hour in the first media. The sperm are then primed for activation by addition of the first capacitation trigger and incubated again for an hour and then fully activated by addition of the second capacitation trigger and incubated for 15 minutes. This sperm preparation is now ready for insemination or it can be pelleted and resuspended in fertilization media. The first step of the process for IUI are the same as for IVF, but the final capacitation trigger is not added, as this will occur when the sperm preparation is inseminated into the uterus. We've optimized both the buffer composition and the incubation time to provide the optimal sperm activation while minimizing the hands-on time for technicians and also meeting requirements of labs in, in order to process the sperm. And I just wanna to note too, that this is currently a clinical stage product and it's being evaluated in an IVF clinical trial that I'll describe toward the end of the talk. So we've done a fair amount of preclinical research to evaluate the impact of optimizing sperm metabolism on outcomes in mouse IVF and IUI. And that's somewhat recognizing that the metabolic pathways involved in sperm activation are conserved between mouse and human. In these experiments um, on, this, on this data slide and on the subsequent data slide, the sperm are isolated from the mouse epididymis and split into two groups. Half were activated using control conditions and the other half were activated using our sperm treatment. When we do this and we do computer-aided sperm analysis, we observe a threefold increase in the percentage of the sperm that are classified as hyperactive on average. 
This corresponds to an increase in fertilization. So treated sperm fertilized 91% of oocytes as measured by two cell embryo formation compared to 53% with control activated sperm. Interestingly, we observed impacts beyond fertilization as 86% of two cell embryos generated with treated sperm developed into blastocyst compared to 59% of two cell embryos from control activated sperm, indicating that beyond just the motility phenotype of the sperm and the ability to fertilize the egg, the sperm treatment improves development of two cell embryos to blastocyst in this mouse system. And then when we looked at embryo transfer, so we transferred the same number of embryos um, generated with control activated sperm versus our treatment activated sperm, we observed a better live birth rate per embryo transfer um, in the treated sperm. Of the 170 embryos transferred per arm, threefold more embryos resulted in births compared to control. Another observation from this data set was that 100% of the female mice that had an embryo transferred from treated sperm had at least one pup compared to 56% of control. In a mouse IUI system where sperm were primed and then inseminated, we observed six-fold more pups born with treated sperm compared to control conditions. And 70% of females inseminated with treated sperm had pups compared to 40% of control. As a whole, this mouse data set indicates that optimizing sperm metabolism improves sperm function and fertilization and sets the embryo on a trajectory towards successful embryo development and live birth. We further developed the same concept of optimizing sperm metabolism for use on human sperm. This data is video captured from computer-aided sperm analysis on sperm from a single ejaculate. Half was processed using a commercially available sperm prep reagent and half using our sperm treatment. You can see that under standard conditions, most of the sperm are classified as weak with no cells classified as progressive, intermediate, or hyperactive. While in the treated conditions, the fraction of sperm classified as weak is reduced and the fraction of sperm that are classified as progressive, intermediate, and hyperactive is increased. And obviously this is from one sperm sample in one data set, but it's illustrative of what we've seen over multiple experiments. Um, this slide shows the compilation of results from the sperm samples from 48 men who were in couples seeking treatment for infertility. Again, showing that when sperm from the same ejaculate are treated, there's a reduction in sperm classified as slow and an increase in sperm classified as progressive, intermediate, and hyperactivated compared to control conditions. Another way to visualize this data is by looking at the individual parameters that are measure, measured by the CASA system rather than the composite of the hyperactivated classification. Curvilinear velocity is an important feature of hyperactivated motility. And this graph shows the distribution of individual sperm shell cells that exhibited specific curvilinear velocities in sperm from men in our healthy donor program that are activated with control conditions, and that's shown in blue, or um, activated using our treatment conditions, which is shown in green. And then we also have sperm samples from men who are in couples seeking, tre seeking treatment for infertility activated using control conditions shown in orange or activating using our treatment in red. These results demonstrate that overall, the sperm from men seeking treatment for infertility have lower VCL than healthy donors when activated with control conditions. With treatment, the distribution of VCL in the samples from men seeking treatment for infertility is much closer to healthy donors. And we even see an increase in VCL in sperm from healthy men with treatment compared to control. Additionally, we observed at least a 25% increase in sperm exhibiting hyperactive and intermediate motility in 90% of the samples tested for men and couples seeking treatment for infertility, indicating a response in most samples. 
Finally, we were interested to understand any literature on human sperm motility parameters and success in IVF. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, there's some data from a paper on 150 couples undergoing IVF, where the authors evaluated a number of sperm parameters in couples that achieved a pregnancy versus those that didn't, and one of which was hyperactive motility. We reanalyzed our data using the definition of hyperactivation in the publication, and that's the data shown on the left. And what we show in using that definition is that with control conditions, on average, 7.5% of sperm hyperactivate, compared to 17.5% when the sperm are treated. In the published data, this level of hyperactivation is correlated with achieving a pregnancy. However, we want to generate our own data in a robust blinded clinical study. For this study, we have focused on the in vitro portion of an IVF cycle, which gives us the opportunity for a split insemination design in which sperm is isolated and half is treated with a standard sperm preparation and half with our treatment. And then eggs are randomly assigned to the control or treatment arm. Fertilization rate and embryo development are assessed with the number of high quality eupoid blastocyst per mature oocyte as the primary endpoint. We'll follow subjects for pregnancy and live birth outcomes as well. With 83 couples, the study has over 80% power to detect a mean difference between groups of one high quality eupoid blastocyst per 10 oocytes retrieved using a paired analysis. As of now, we have more than 95% of patients that have completed the main part of the study, and we anticipate results from that main portion of the study by the end of this year. In summary, we have developed a new approach to activating sperm for ART by optimizing how the metabolic pathways in sperm are activated ex vivo, and show that in mouse models, this results in improved fertilization, blastocyst development, and live birth rates. In preclinical studies on human sperm, this optimized activation of sperm metabolism restores a normal motility phenotype in samples from men seeking treatment for infertility. The observed increase in hyperactivation with our sperm treatment should be sufficient to improve pregnancy rates based on published data. And we're currently testing this in a clinical trial to evaluate impact on the number of high quality embryos from an IVF cycle. Before concluding, I want to acknowledge the team at Ohana that has been instrumental to advancing the program. And specifically, several of my current and former colleagues who have led the research and clinical development for this program. Uh, Felipe Navarrete is a senior scientist at Ohana and an expert in sperm capacitation. And he's led the discovery and early development for this program. Shannon Rainsford and Joe Broncoli, who have both moved on to pursue graduate degrees, were critical in generating key pieces of data that helped us make decisions early on in this program. Melissa Pazuyak is a scientist at Ohana and an excellent in vivo biologist who has supported generation of data to support this program. And I also just want to acknowledge the leadership of Eric Verfine, our CSO. And then of course, you know, the research team develops the, the idea and the science behind something, and then it's instrumental to have an excellent clinical team to hand off to. And so I just want to acknowledge our CSO, Romero Castro Santa Maria, our head of clinical, Alka Badaki, and Shalise Bush, who's been a key, key player in making sure that our protocol is strong and executed well at clinical sites. Thank you for that excellent presentation. And we have time for a couple of questions. So uh, very thrilled to see the work that you're doing and have done on sperm pre-fertilization events. It's near and dear to my heart. Um, what I would like to ask is, we know that it is a spectrum for male factor infertility. Mm -hmm. And so what proportion of uh, men across the spectrum, um, do you believe that uh, you'll be able to see improvement? It's such a great question because it's also, you know, we think about it not necessarily specifically focused on male factor infertility, 
but whether this approach could improve also if, you know, if it's an unexplained or a female factor. What we've seen when we looked at samples from men seeking treatment for infertility, and we don't have um, corresponding data on their diagnoses. And so it's going to be a mix of, you know, a male factor, unexplained or female factor. And across, you know, that variety of samples, we see about 90% will respond using a criteria that we've defined as 25% increase relative to control activation. Mm -hmm. We also see in our healthy donor population with no known infertility that we see a smaller, but uh, still an increase in the percentage of sperm that will hyperactivate. Well, thank you. And I'll be looking forward uh, to seeing the results of your studies. Us too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll turn it back over to Marlene. Uh, thank you again uh, very much. Thank you. Uh, don't go away, Kathleen. Don't go too far. We'll have more questions for you at the end. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Dr. John Aiken, who is the Distinguished Laureate Professor at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales, Australia. For anyone who's been in the field of reproductive physiology, and particularly for those of us such as Mary and I, who both have PhDs that focused on sperm function, Dr. Aiken has been a household name, if you will, for decades. The first time I became familiar with Dr. Aiken's work was reading his papers in the 80s on seminal plasma reactive oxygen species and the effect of centrifugation during semen processing on ROS formation. During the course of his very distinguished career, he has published over 600 articles. 629 was the highest number I could find. Participated in 12 patent applications and lectured around the world. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome him to the International IVF Initiative webinar. Thank you and welcome Dr. Aiken. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much indeed. And uh, a very warm welcome from uh, the east coast of Australia. I'm speaking to you from Boomerang Beach, which is uh, just uh, north of Newcastle. And uh, we are just now going from winter into spring. And this is uh, spring just outside my house uh, a couple of days ago. And a deep thank you to the organizers of this, uh, this conference. It's a great pleasure to be here and to give you a talk about paternal aging and the origins of spontaneous mutations. And I thought a good place to start such a talk would be uh, with uh, Ramjit Raga. So Ramjit is the, uh, claim to be anyway, the oldest father in the world. He had this child he's holding at the age of 96 and uh, said he wanted even more children. Uh, sadly, that was not to be. He passed away earlier this year. Uh, but his image serves to remind us that uh, male and female reproduction are very different in the sense that men don't suffer the same precipitous decline of fertility in midlife that women do. Men can still sire children into their dotage, um, but what changes with time is the uh, incidence of diseases in their offspring. And we have known about this for, for some time. Uh, the classic conditions are things like Apert syndrome and uh, achondroplasia. Uh, which increase exponentially with the age of the father at the moment of conception. These particular um, conditions, I think, represent very particular cases. Um, they are mutations in fibroblast growth factor receptors 2 and 3, and the etiology involves so something called the selfish spermatogonia selection model, which means that when germ cells acquire these particular mutations, they undergo a very rapid clonal expansion. So that if you take a test uh, section through a testis of a 78 year old male, you'll find sudden clusters of these uh, germ cells in his uh, seminiferous tubule. But I think this is uh, a very particular case. That's not how most mutations uh, arise in the male germline. We have, as I've said, known about these conditions and their relationship with these mutations for decades. More recently, we've become aware that a whole range of other diseases, and these are largely brain disorders such as bipolar disease, autism, uh, spontaneous schizophrenia, 
attention deficit to hyperactivity disorder, epilepsy, all of these conditions show a strong correlation with the age of the father at the moment of conception. And the obvious question is, well, why would this be? Well, one thing that happens as fathers age is that the mutational load carried by their children increases as a linear function of their age. And this is data actually on the Icelandic population, and it shows this very beautifully, that as fathers age, there's a linear increase in the incidence of mutations in their children. And two things to note about this particular graph. First is, look at the x-axis. These are not old men. These are men who, uh, between the ages of 15 and 45, they're men of normal reproductive age. And uh, the number of de novo mutations increases, and then it gets to a certain point when the dots turn from red, from black into red, as the incidence of uh, autism suddenly starts to increase. So there is something happening in the male germline with age that leads to an increase in mutational load in the children, and that mutational load then correlates with these various disorders in the offspring. So what is that something? What is going on here? Well, the classic explanation is a replication error. So if you're a 15-year-old boy, your germ cells have been through 35 rounds of replication. But if you're a 50-year-old man, your germ cells have been through 840 rounds of replication. And with every round of replication, there's a risk that a defect will occur, an error will occur. Uh, that will generate a mutation. And that's been an explanation that the field has been, uh, I, I guess, happy with for a long period of time. But it's certainly not the whole story. And we know that because uh, if you look at the incidence of the term and panel derived mutations in children as a function of parental age, there is a difference between paternal and maternal, even at the age of 15 when uh, this cohort are first having their children. So it can't be replication error at this early age. There must be something else going on which is causing uh, these mutations. And incidentally, if you look at these graphs, what it tells you is that uh, at um, ultimately 75% of de novo mutations will originate in men. Uh, not in women. So something happening in the male germline responsible for these mutations. Uh, we've known for a very long period of time that human semen quality is poor. You only have to look at this micrograph um, to see that there are very few normal looking cells in an average human ejaculate. And if you look at their motility, this is actually quite good motility, um, but uh, these cells are moving around at about 25 microns a second. If we were looking at uh, the sperm cells from the wallabies that are hopping around the bush around me, their sperm cells are moving around at 30, 300 microns a second, so 10 times faster. So human spermatozoa, not particularly good. And as a consequence of that, roughly one in 20 males has uh, a fertility problem. And mostly this is due to defective sperm function. Most men produce enough spermatozoa to fertilize an egg. Uh, you don't need very many. Um, but uh, in cases of male infertility, the sperm have lost their capacity to either find or fertilize the egg in vivo. Many, many years ago, more years ago than I care to remember, we used bioassays to look at the fertilizing capacity of human sperm. And this is that uh, bioassay, it's the uh, zona-free hamster egg penetration test, as it was known, uh, a much maligned method of uh, detecting um, the fertilizing capacity of human sperm. It was never meant as a diagnostic technique, but as an experimental technique, it was actually quite valuable. And it's enabled us to look at uh, the capacity of cells to undergo a series of changes. Sperm cells, human sperm cells, will only fuse with a hamster egg if they have capacitated, acrosome reacted, and generated a fusogenic equatorial segment. So the biology of this system was reflective of the homologous situation. And although it was never a good diagnostic assay, it was a very good experimental technique. 
and enabled us to uh, generate this correlation, which basically summarizes a decade of work. And that is that if you look at the uh, uh, patient population, you will find that most, certainly not all, but most um, men who had sperm that performed very poorly in this assay exhibited high levels of reactive oxygen species generation. Whereas you look in the fertile controls, the story is essentially the opposite where you have high rates of sperm oocyte fusion, low levels of reactive oxygen species generation. This has been a, a, a very large field now. If you put uh, reactive oxygen species and sperm into PubMed, you'll come up with thousands of references. And we've learned a lot about uh, how these uh, factors intersect. The thing I want to highlight today is that uh, in these subfertile men, the reactive oxygen species that are being generated are targeting uh, the uh, DNA in the sperm nucleus and the mitochondria. The guanine residues are particularly vulnerable uh, to oxidative attack. And when that happens, you generate this uh, uh, base adduct, 8-hydroxy 2 prime deoxyguanosine, or 8-oxo-G for short. And um, this destabilizes the DNA backbone, uh, leading to uh, a basic sites and DNA fragmentation. Indeed, uh, if you look at the level of oxidative DNA damage in human sperm, it correlates very well with the levels of DNA fragmentation, uh, leading us to conclude that uh, most, certainly not all, but most DNA fragmentation in human spermatozoa is oxidatively induced. So DNA fragmentation is definitely a, a, a characteristic of human spermatozoa. We have known this for a very long period of time. Um, using comet assays to look at DNA damage, for example, you can show that uh, in the patient population, a large number of men have much higher than normal levels of DNA fragmentation in their sperm. And this is highly correlated with the age of the donor. So if you're over the age of uh, 36, um, then you have three times the amount of DNA damage in your sperm compared with somebody under that age. And uh, the relationship is approximately linear. The older the donor, uh, the more DNA damage uh, you will find. These data were generated using a comet assay. Um, more recently, Don Evanson uh, has pulled together a lifetime's work, over 25,000 men, analyzed for um, DNA fragmentation using the SCARSA assay. And he's just published the results in fertility and sterility. And this shows the smoothed uh, percent DFI as a function of age. So very clear here that the older the men, uh, the uh, more DNA fragmentation uh, they have in their gametes and this DNA fragmentation is oxidatively induced. Well, if oxidative DNA damage is so much, uh, so important to the cells, how do they actually protect themselves from uh, this kind of damage? This is a very simplistic presentation of the, um, of the base excision repair pathway. Um, this I'm, uh, is meant to portray a uh, DNA duplex. This little red box is the oxidized base and it's the enzyme that initiates DNA repair is called OG1. It's a uh, glycosylase, and it serves to remove this oxidized uh, base from the DNA, creating uh, an abasic site. Sperm do have OG1. Uh, they have it in their nucleus, they have it in their mitochondria. There are two isoforms, one uh, for the nuclear DNA, one for the mitochondrial DNA. And we can confirm the presence of uh, this enzyme, both biochemically and by proteomics. So tick, uh, these cells definitely have OG1. The next uh, enzymes uh, or, or proteins involved in base excision repair are the AP endonuclease and a scaffolding protein called XRCC1. Sperm cells uh, do not have either of these proteins. They don't have APE1, they don't have XRCC1. Doesn't matter if you look by immunocytochemistry or Western blot, they're simply not there. 
And because sperm do not have these, uh, these proteins, the base excision repair pathway stalls. So all a sperm cell can do is remove the oxidized base and create an abasic site. And that's all it can do. But we shouldn't fret because uh, the egg is actually replete with AP1 and XRCC1. So in a perfect world, I think what's supposed to happen is that if DNA becomes oxidatively damaged in the sperm cell, it will remove the oxidized base to create an abasic site. And then we'll leave it to the egg to complete the DNA repair pathway. So it's a beautiful example of uh, male-female uh, collaboration or collusion, if you like, in order to uh, solve the problem of oxidative DNA damage. There is, however, <clears throat> a problem. And that problem is that the oocyte has very little Og1 by immunocyte chemistry, by uh, Western blot, very little of this enzyme. So if a sperm cell should fertilize an egg still carrying these oxidized base residues, there's nothing that the egg can do about it because it has very little capacity to remove that. And these uh, adoxo lesions will persist into S, S phase of the first mitotic division and uh, cause a mutation. And this is a real risk because we know that if we look at the average human ejaculate, you can find many cells that are still adoxoguanine positive. And those cells, once they fertilize the egg, will be a challenge. And if those oxidized residues persist into the DNA replication, it may well create uh, mutations. The way it does that is through something very interesting called Hoogstein base pairing. Now, uh, <coughs> I don't suppose there's much interest in biochemistry out there, but <coughs> just uh, everyone will know that guanine pairs with cytosine and adenine pairs with thymine. However, if the guanine residues become oxidized, they develop a new capacity, which by reorientating themselves, enables them to bind not to cytosine, but to adenine. So you get these adenine adoxo G base pairs. And in the re next round of replication, that oxidized base will be replaced by a thymine. So you get a GC to TA transversion. And if you actually do the experiment, you take a mouse and you knock out all of the DNA uh, base excision repair enzymes and produce mice that have very high levels of 8-oxoguanine in their gametes. Their offspring uh, have very miserable lives. They live a very short time compared to the heterozygotes. They accumulate a lot of cancers and uh, they have uh, mutation rates that are 18-fold higher than basal level, mostly GC to TA transversions, as we would have predicted. In humankind, I think you see this kind of thing in, for example, smoking. So if you're a man and you smoke heavily, you're, uh, there is a lot of DNA damage in your gametes and it's mostly oxidative DNA damage. And we can't do the experiments in humans, but if we do the experiment in mice and expose them not to cigarette smoke, but to benzpyrene, the major um, uh, mutagen in cigarette smoke, then the young are born carrying high levels of mutations, and they're mostly the GC to TA transversions and GC to AT transitions that we would have anticipated. This kind of uh, oxidative DNA damage to human spermatozoa in the case of men who smoke heavily doesn't have a massive impact on their fertility. However, it does have an impact on their offspring because of the mutations it generates and this is just the result of a meta-analysis uh, published by Lee, and there are other more recent meta-analyses confirming this, uh, and showing that the children of men who smoke have a significantly elevated chance of developing childhood cancer. And this, for me, is a game changer as far as smoking is concerned. If I say smoking, uh, you normally would think of uh, diseases of the perpetrator. You'd think of uh, coronary heart disease or lung cancer. But what's much more uh, sinister is that if you smoke heavily, you induce high levels of mutation in your gametes. And that's responsible for increased uh, childhood cancer in your offspring. And because the mutations are in the germline, there is the potential that this will persist with your lineage for a significant period of time. 
Smoking has been responsible for introducing millions of mutations into our species, the consequence of which we still don't really understand. So, if we summarize all of that, what I think is happening is that the things that we've been talking about, paternal age and smoking, but there are many other things as well, serve to create a state of oxidative stress in the germline, which leads to oxidative DNA damage. These sperm then fertilize the egg, either naturally or they're induced to do so with IVF or ICSI. And then the poor egg has got just a few hours to try to repair all that DNA damage before we initiate uh, DNA synthesis for the first mitotic division. And uh, if the egg makes a mistake at that point, it will create mutations that then are responsible for the various brain disorders and cancers that we see in the offspring. And this is particularly the case with adoxoguanine residues that the egg is very uh, um, defective at uh, repairing. So if all this is true, then it becomes uh, very interesting to know whether there are hotspots for oxidative damage within the sperm genome. Now the way that DNA is packaged into a sperm head is really fascinating. Um, the sperm becomes complex with proteins and uh, develops these kind of donut-like structures known as toroids. Within these toroids, the uh, condensed state of the DNA is such that it's almost crystalline, and it's actually very difficult to damage that DNA. But each of these donut-like toroids is connected to the next by a piece of interlinker DNA, which is attached to the nuclear matrix. And it turns out that this is the DNA which is vulnerable to oxidative attack. And if we look at sperm cells and consider which areas of the genome become oxidatively attacked, uh, we find, as we might have predicted, that the damage is, predict is spread across the genome. And generally speaking, uh, the, the chromosome, the more oxidative damage there is within it. But there are two exceptions, really interesting exceptions. One of the sex chromosomes. So the sex chromosomes are somehow protected from oxidative attack. Uh, my colleague uh, Joel Dreve has done exactly the same study in mice and finds exactly the same thing. But there is one chromosome, chromosome 15, which is particularly vulnerable to oxidative attack. And we don't yet know why it could be its position in the sperm head, but it is particularly vulnerable. This is chromosome 15. And down here, I've aligned the oxidized base lesions we find across that chromosome. So we find these uh, oxidized bases everywhere, but there is a domain here around Q, uh, 15Q11 to 15Q14-15, where uh, we see a highly elevated level of oxidative DNA damage. Interestingly, to that region of the genome has been traced uh, mutations that cause autism, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, and Marfan syndrome. And interestingly, all of these conditions are highly correlated with the age of the father at the moment of uh, conception. So what we think happens is that as men age, they develop more and more oxidized DNA damage in their spermatozoa. This oxidative DNA damage is uh, concentrated in this area of the genome on chromosome 15, and induces mutations, different kinds of mutations, duplications, deletions, and so on. But these mutations are then responsible for the appearance of these conditions in their offspring. Uh, and of course, age is just one way that you induce oxidative stress in the germline. There are many others, and we've considered one, which is smoking. And as I've already told you, as men smoke, and it doesn't matter if you smoke before conception or during pregnancy, there is an increase in the risk of childhood cancer in your offspring. This is the mean risk and these are the confidence limits. But there is an increase in the risk of cancer in your offspring. And then if you look at where the mutations are that cause this disease, you find that they are exactly in that spot where the uh, oxidative damage is occurring on chromosome 15. 
And of course, uh, infertility is another way in which you induce oxidative stress in the germline. So it would be entirely predictable that uh, conditions like autism would be increased in the children of uh, patients who are coming for assisted reproductive technology. And indeed, this study by Kissin et al. and quite a large number of patients from California, over 30,000, uh, did show an increase in the incidence of uh, autism in children conceived by ICSI, not IVF. And uh, we presume this is because with ICSI, there is less sperm selection than there is with IVF. At least with IVF, you've got the zona pellucida to help you, and motility to some extent, to help you select the best gametes but you don't have that luxury with ICSI. And so DNA damaged sperm are being inserted into the egg. And one of the consequences you see is this increased risk of autism. It's a small increase in risk. It represents about a 1% increase in risk. And uh, at a patient for patient level, that risk may not be considered significant. But when, as in Australia, you've got 5% of your population being produced by IVF, this starts to have consequences at a national level, many more cases of autism because of the widespread practice of ART in our general population. Now, what can we do about it? Well, there are just uh, two things we can do uh, currently. And one is to try to isolate sperm cells that are free of um, uh, oxidized DNA damage before we use them for ART. There are a number of uh, different techniques which people use routinely in their clinics, density gradient centrifugation, swim ups. Um, some people do a swim down, glass wheel filtration. Suddenly a lot of microfluidic systems have appeared on the market and uh, um, uh, and employing principles like chemotaxis, rheotaxis and thermotaxis to help isolate the cells. And in my own laboratory, we've been trying to develop an electrophoretic technique um, to isolate sperm cells. And this is just data from that electrophoretic technique uh, showing that uh, sperm cells from a variety of different sources, when they're isolated using electrophoresis, so the idea here is have much higher than normal levels of negative charge, uh, they have lower levels of DNA damage. I don't advocate for any particular method. I'm just saying that we need to very carefully compare these methods um, when uh, thinking of the best way to isolate cells for IVF. And then finally, antioxidant therapy. For this purpose, we use the GPX knockout mice produced by Joel Dreve. And this is an ideal mouse because it has a very uh, oxidative stress localized to the epididymis. The testis is absolutely normal. But in the epididymis, there is no uh, antioxidant protection. And the result is the sperm accumulate large amounts of oxidized DNA damage. If you give these mice antioxidant therapy, uh, then you both increase sperm number and decrease the amounts of DNA damage. So uh, in summary, oxidative stress is a major contributor to male and female infertility. It's a major factor in the etiology of DNA damage. It's exacerbated by factors like age, smoking, and other things I haven't mentioned, like obesity and chemical exposures. It increases the mutational load in the offspring, particularly on chromosome 15, and that may be correlated with positions such as uh, autism and childhood cancer. And to resolve this problem, we need to use improved methods of sperm selection and uh, think about clinical trials for antioxidant therapy. Just remains for me to uh, thank my collaborators and the various uh, organizations that have helped fund this work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I know Dr. Aiken is here. That was a, a video recording to spare him <laughs> the pain of doing this at 5 a.m., but I know he is here. So I know I have a question Mary has that I'm going to pull from the list. Mary has a couple of questions and then we'll throw this open to the audience as long as people are throwing questions our way, we'll be asking both speakers questions. Uh, my first question to you, it would be uh, one that Jacques Cohen posted on the q and I, I know you talked about it a little bit, but what happens when a man stops smoking or changes his lifestyle? Um, is there a point at which some of these can be reversed or, um, 
can you tell me how long it might take in terms of recovery, if it's possible? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, uh, one of the things that's really important about the male germline is that the spermatogonial stem cells have fantastic DNA surveillance and repair. So uh, if you do the experiment as we have done, where you give mice, for example, chemotherapeutic agents that completely suppress spermatogenesis, and then you allow the spermatogenesis to come back, and then you make those mice and look at the mutation frequency in the offspring, you find there is no change. So the spermatogonial stem cell population is well protected and uh, really quite robust. Uh, however, as those germ cells differentiate into sperm, they progressively lose their capacity for, for DNA repair. And that's why you suddenly see these increases in oxidative DNA damage. So as a consequence of that, uh, you would predict that if you stop smoking within one or two spermatogenic cycles to clear out the cells that have um, um, postmeiotic cells that have suffered damage, you would return to normal. So I think if you stop smoking uh, within a few months, uh, the damage that you've induced should go away and uh, your uh, chances of uh, um, conceiving a child with no mutations or no elevated mutations will be normal. Let me, let me ask one more and then I'll pass it to Mary. Um, why do you think, I was under the impression that autism was a polygenic, if you can call it that condition, that there were multiple gene sites that had a, an influence on that. Why do you think um, 15, that section of 15 is so unique in causing, you know, I mean, all of these four diseases, but yeah. why that section rather than another section? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a question we ask ourselves. Um, we, uh, when you expose uh, spermatozoa to an oxidative stress, you do find oxidative DNA damage throughout the whole genome. So I don't want to give the impression that the only area being damaged is this area on chromosome 15. But what I am saying is if you compare that chromosome with all the others, it suffers a disproportionately large amount of DNA damage. And we don't know why. Uh, I suspect it's something to do with the way the chromosome is packaged into the sperm head, which is not a random process. Sperm chromosomes come to lie in particular positions. And my suspicion is it's quite far back in the sperm head, close to the mitochondria where the free radicals are coming from. Uh, and you're right, of course, autism, many of these things are polygenic and uh, multifactorial. And this is just, um, uh, and, and that's probably why the increase in autism rates is, uh, is minor. It's not a 1% it's a increase risk, so it's not a, a major change. Um, but it is a change. And uh, the point I was trying to make is that um, if you look at these sort of things from a patient perspective, the increase in risk is infinitesimal and you needn't worry about it. But as more and more of our populations are generated by uh, assisted conception therapy, then just the scale of the operation means that uh, there are problems that we should address um, that have implications for national health services and uh, populations. And, um, and of course, autism is just, uh, you know, one phenotypic change. And, and my fundamental point is that we shouldn't focus on birth defects of this kind. What we should really be looking at is mutational load. How the mutational load then gets reflected in the health of the offspring is uh, another question. Uh, and what I'm very keen to see is uh, our comparisons of mutational load carried by children conceived naturally or with IVF or with ICSI. Because the prediction is that you would have higher mutational loads in ICSI created children compared with natural and maybe IVF because of the differences in sperm selection stringency. Well, you're really in trouble if you're the child of an overweight man who was a smoker who did IVF with ICSI then, aren't you? <laughs> Mary, you had, you had some questions. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Hello, Professor Aiken. Very much enjoyed your presentation. My first is, just, I'll see if I have time for both. I'll check with Marlene. So I'll ask first the societal question. And so, at least in the United States, uh, there has been a, a real focus on educating women 
especially by ASRM and other groups uh, and fertility centers on their, on their fertility potential and the impact of aging. And what we've seen is really a, a, a large increase, although it's not to the hugest numbers yet in the United States of women freezing their eggs. When one thinks about the poor quality of uh, sperm and how it's impacted aging, should we start messaging um, to really educate men, one, to be in the best of health uh, as we do for women, and also perhaps to freeze a semen specimen, which is a mm -hmm. whole lot easier than freezing your eggs. What are your thoughts yeah. on a global level? Yes, thank you for that question. And uh, I think um, yes and no. So uh, yes, I, I think, of course, uh, the, uh, the, there is a, a, an important role in education of men in appropriate lifestyles. And there is no question, because spermatogenesis is such a dynamic process, it's very reflective of your overall health. Mm -hmm. And so if you are obese, if you are smoking heavily, if you are doing all these things that uh, can affect uh, your overall health, they're probably having an impact on your germline. And um, we showed many years ago that the DNA in the sperm is more vulnerable to damage than the functionality of the cell. So, uh, so sperm with damaged DNA can still fertilize eggs. And, uh, and that's what we think then increases the mutational load in the offspring. And uh, so I think there's every reason to educate men on having a healthy lifestyle. And we have talked uh, in the past about uh, antioxidant therapy as a kind of prophylactic treatment that before you go for IVF, you should take antioxidants just to make sure the DNA is in the best possible state before you go for IVF or, or ICSI. And then cryo storage, yes, uh, Jacques also asked me the same question. And I guess my response is that we do know that cryo storage induces DNA damage in sperm cells. Uh, when you freeze and thaw a cell, you in particular disrupt the functionality of the mitochondria. Mm. The mitochondria then start to leak electrons and create reactive oxygen species. So there is a danger that you will actually create DNA damage rather than solve the problem if you go through this cryo storage route. Uh, so I think the answer is uh, better education rather than more cryo storage. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you very much. Marlene, may I ask the second, or is there someone else who would oh, like to ask a question? Please go right ahead, and then we'll open um, up. And so my second question is more on the scientific side. Uh, you focused and gave us great information from the DNA side. What about from the RNA side and small non-coding messenger RNA, which are thought yeah. to have impact on post early post-fertilization uh, development? Yeah, no, that's a, uh, another great question. So yes, uh, the RNA in sperm cells is even more vulnerable to damage than the DNA. Now, the DNA, as I've pointed out, is mostly packaged with proteins and quite resistant. And it's just a small fraction of the total DNA, which is vulnerable. But the RNA is not packaged in this way. And it is, is vulnerable to attack. And uh, we anticipate that that wouldn't have an impact necessarily on fertilization rates, but could have an impact on the developmental normality of the offspring. And that's the kind of information we are getting from animal studies. And um, I guess the uh, um, jury is still out as to just, just how important these epigenetic factors are in yeah. um, creating a normal pattern of development. Thank you. Okay. All right, now we'll start taking some of the questions. We'll just alternate Mary and I asking questions from the, the Q&A. I'll start with another uh, Jacques Cohen question to Kathleen. We'll give uh, John a, a moment to catch his breath. So is Ohana sperm prep studied in a multi-generational mouse model to assess potential toxicity and mutational effects long-term? So what we have done, um, not, not specifically thinking about you know, designing a study for multi-generational evaluation, but we have looked at um, and observed long-term the pups that have been generated in some of these studies. And, you know, one of the questions that we had early on was the potential impact that it might have on the fertility of the offspring. And so what we've done is we've, you know, observed for normal growth and development and 
the offspring that are generated using um, our sperm activation procedure compared to a control sperm activation procedure, there's no difference in um, growth and development or fertility. Thank you. Mary, mm -hmm. do you want to pick your question? Sure, there was um, another uh, question that was in the chat, and uh, it was for you, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. And so um, are you able to uh, give any additional information on the mechanism of action of uh, Ohana's product, or is uh, that you've, or have you provided all you can from a proprietary standpoint? Uh, I mean, I, I think I can, I can give a, maybe a little bit longer <laughs> explanation or longer, I don't know if it's going to be more detail, but, um, you know, essentially what we're doing is, is activating um, sequentially oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis pathways. And when we do that, what we see, um, interestingly, what we observe when we do the first priming, we call it priming step, where we, we activate oxidative phosphorylation. There's really no difference in the sperm motility. What really happens is when you activate glycolysis, it triggers that large increase in hyperactivation. And then we also observe differences in the sperm that are classified as um, progressive and intermediate. And so I think some of the data I showed had that kind of the nuance of the shift from being weak or slow into these higher motility states of progressive, intermediate, and hyperactivated. The final composition of the sperm prep after the procedure is done is substantially similar to what's currently used in ART today. It's the timing of the introduction of these capacitation triggers that, that is, is having the effect that we're showing. Thank you. And from a hacker activation standpoint, do you see the sperm going in and out of hyperactivation or moving back and forth between the intermediate, the weak intermediate? Uh, because that's often just that's been described in the literature and, and you're collecting a great deal of information in this area. Yes, I will say though, we're, you know, we're collecting a snapshot of I think about a 60 second or 60 frames per second or something like that. You know, it's a quick image of the sperm. It's a great question kind of temporally because we're looking at we're looking at individual cells, but then categorizing them based on population. And something that I've thought a lot about is, yeah, so do do some of those hyperactivated sperm then burn out and other ones, you know, progressive ones become hyperactivated. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, the class of data that we've collected to date doesn't give us that particular view, and it's it's very hard to go back and look at the same thing again <laughs> later mm -hmm. on. So, mm -hmm. well, thank you. I'll turn it back to you, Marlene. So, Veronica Magdance, to just keep going on in this area for a couple more minutes, um, mm -hmm. said, "Thanks for the nice talk and what a great approach. Can you elaborate a bit on how the hyperactivation is triggered?" and how long it usually lasts. So what we see is that the hyperactivation really happens very quickly after you trigger the glycolysis pathway. Um, and then we've, we've measured the samples uh, out to about eight hours and see that, that the, the percentage of sperm that are identified or characterized as hyperactivated is stable for that amount of time. And that's something I think is important for folks if they're trying to use this type of procedure clinically is to know that there's, there's a time window before they actually have to introduce to the egg. So that answered a couple of the other questions <laughs> on our list. Mm -hmm. What about um, the, how accurately you can measure this on the, the CASA. I'm sure we all have some concerns, you know, the sperm are moving in and out. Um, yeah. You're using, uh, you're using the Hamilton Thorn, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're using the Hamilton Thorn system. And, um, you know, we've done a lot of characterization because there's, you know, you, you want to make sure that what you're measuring is what you think you're measuring. And so there's different ways that we look at this. Um, so we use the Hamilton Thorn system, and then we use the published Casanova 
machine learning algorithm that, that is uh, available to categorize sperm as hyperactive versus progressive intermediate. Um, and we have some thresholds set that define how long the sperm head has to be in frame. So how long of the data trace you have to collect in order to categorize a sperm. And then the other thing that we do is, um, and I showed some of the data here too, is, is, is look at the individual sperm parameters like VCL to make sure that you know, we're seeing effects on the individual parameters not just kind of the composite picture that, that something like hyperactivation is characterized as. Mary? Mary, you had have more, you wanna ask some more? No, oh, uh, I've gone through my list of questions, thank you. Okay, all right. So yeah. what, what's, your, what's your cutoff for uh, BCL as so being indicative of hyperactivation? Yeah, so when we do, so there's there's different ways that this is done. Um, and so, uh, you know, I showed some calculations based on the Donnelly data. I'm just looking it up to make I have it right. So uh, in, the, in that, that definition uses three parameters and curvilinear velocity greater than 100 is one of those parameters. Um, the Casanova definition is based on a machine learning computational algorithm. And so um, it's, it's not as easy to say it's like this and that. It's basically the, the, the computer system has been taught by an individual kind of picking out the hyperactive sperm versus the intermediate sperm. And then it continues to build the data set as more and more information is fed into it in order to determine what a hyperactivated sperm look like. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's bump back to uh, Dr. Aiken. So what long-term studies do you suggest could elucidate the effects of paternal age on the male genome and treatment conditions? Well, I think that the uh, study that uh, I would like to see done is the one that I mentioned before, which is that uh, we have to start looking at uh, mutational load in children and seeing how that correlates with uh, paternal age. There's already uh, the beginning of some data there, and we just need to understand um, what the uh, causes of that increased mutational frequency are. Some of it, as I've mentioned, may be oxidative stress, but there may be other reasons as well. So, um, and the other thing which I think is interesting is the cooperation between the male and the female germline. I pointed out that 75% of all de novo mutations in our species arise as a function of paternal age, but the rest are a function of maternal age. And uh, the hypothesis would be that uh, as men age, they get more and more DNA damage in their gametes. But as women age, the ability of their eggs to repair that DNA damage becomes uh, compromised and uh, generating some experimental data to uh, confirm that that relationship would be very valuable if we could do it. And what, I, uh, yes. have another question. May yes. I go ahead? Yes. So this one is from uh, one of our attendees, uh, Fathi uh, Korea, Korea, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, but this is uh, a question I think uh, both of our speakers could address, and it's a very good one to tie the two presentations together. And so in your presentation, uh, Dr. Saib, um, you look at the means of increasing sperm function. Um, uh, Professor Aiken, yours emphasized the impact of mutation on sperm. And so the question to each of you is, how can we establish means and protocols to maximize sperm function and hyperactivated motility, but also minimize mutation in those selected sperm? I'll ask you first, um, Kathleen, uh, and then you next, John. I think this is a great question because it gets at a couple of things. I think there's the aspect of the potential uh, DNA damage or oxidation that occurs in the man's body. 
and then what occurs, you know, ex vivo during preparation. Now, one of the things that we looked at, and I can see somebody had a question about it as well, is the, the potential for our stepwise activation to have an effect on DNA damage as measured by a tunnel assay, so looking at, at DNA fragmentation. And we did not see an increase in that. And so that's something that was reassuring for us because that's also something that you could imagine would happen during the, the processing or uh, the ex vivo sperm prep or sperm treatment. Um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question too because I also think that there's not, while these things are studied um, and you know, evaluated from a research perspective, there's not a really great, well-established, robust assay that, can, that is used consistently um, in different groups in order to measure this. And the other thing that I think about too is that um, you know, we, we talk about this from, there's kind of the population aspect. So overall in, in a semen sample or in the modal sperm from a semen sample, what do you see? But I think the other thing that we need to think about is the, the heterogeneity of these types of marks or, or the, the different changes in um, DNA fragmentation, DNA oxidation, kind of DNA damage overall. Because that's also very important as we think about that one sperm. That, that's going to fertilize the egg. Great. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Saib. Before uh, we move on to, to Dr. Aiken, can I ask for a clarification, Kathleen? When you say uh, you didn't see any, any change with processing, was that mm -hmm. relative to um, the completely neat unprocessed sample? Or were you comparing after, did you do a discontinuous gradient on both the control and the experimental? And so did you compare back at the end of the discontinuous gradient or were you comparing both of them all the way back to the neat sample? We, we were comparing post the, post, post the discontinuous gradient. So we were looking at the modal sperm population and we compared from the right after that to the control conditions at the same time point, plus our, our sperm treatment. So we didn't compare to the NEAT. Okay, got it. Thank you, Dr. Aiken. Yes, well, it raises a very interesting question, which Kathleen's referred to, which is uh, how you actually measure DNA damage in sperm cells. And there are uh, many protocols out there, and uh, Kathleen's right, the field has not really standardize which one is the one that we should all be using or whether the, the, the gold standard is yet to be achieved. Uh, one thing I would worry about with the tunnel assay, so the tunnel assay does detect DNA damage obviously, but uh, the way it does so is uh, requires uh, endonuclease to cut the DNA so that you can get the insertion of the new labeled base. And as I've already pointed out, sperm don't actually have the 8-1 endonuclease. So that means that tunnel assay is measuring very late events. Um, I, I think in the perimortem, as the cells are dying, you start to see uh, tunnel signals. Um, but other assays like um, the comet assay and uh, the halo assay are, I think, much more sensitive. And we have actually done the experiment, and I published the results in the Journal of Cell Science a few years ago, where we took sperm cells, submitted them to an oxidative stress, and then measured DNA fragmentation with a variety of different assays. And uh, the, the net result of that was to show that things like Comet and Scarza assays are really quite sensitive. And you get, ultimately get the same result with a tunnel assay, but it takes about 24 to 48 hours for that damage to appear in a tunnel assay. So it would be worth having uh, a look at uh, this phenomenon with some other assays than the, than the tunnel assay ultimately. And it was a question I wanted to ask Kathleen, so I used this opportunity to do it. Um, so, you know, mass sperm, human sperm, they're really quite different beasts in many ways. And one of the ways that they are very different is the quality of the mitochondria. So human sperm cells have terrible mitochondria. They do everything they can to avoid using them. And I think they're harbingers of death. You know, they're the way that the cell undergoes apoptosis. They're not really there to generate much in the way of uh, ATP. Whereas mouse uh, mitochondria 
And different species of mouse will use mitochondria to different extents. There are some species of mouse that use entirely oxidative phosphorylation. Um, Mus musculus, the one that we use most commonly in the lab, has a bit of each, uh, a bit of glycolysis and a, and a bit of uh, oxidative phosphorylation. When you rev up glycolysis, uh, um, you are, of course, then creating substrates that are also going to drive mitochondrial function. And the concern would be that uh, if you rev up mitochondrial function in human sperm cells, you, you will see a, a short term change. But then uh, the cells will, if you like, burn out uh, because of the uh, toxic metabolites that are going to be generated by these mitochondria. But you won't see that in a mouse because the mitochondria are much better sealed. And we have postulated in the past that uh, capacitation is a kind of highway to death. In other words, if you block capacitation, we've developed media now for equine and bovine sperm where we can keep them alive at ambient temperatures for two weeks. Um, don't need to chill, don't need to freeze, they'll just swim around uh, because we suppress capacitation. Now, they don't capacitate, they live long and prosper. As soon as they start to capacitate, they're on the sort of highway to apoptosis. And we talk about that as a continuum once they start that capacitation process they will that will then flow on if they don't find an egg it will flow on into apoptosis and i wondered if you see any evidence of that in your model do you see cells uh, if you rev them up they just burn out a little bit quicker that is a really interesting question and i'm i'm thinking back to the data and i think it relates to some of the questions that we that that others asked about the kind of the duration of the response um, we don't see in, in the windows that we've measured out to eight hours, we don't see a, uh, in, in enzymology, it's called a hook effect, but I don't think that's what I'm talking about. Um, like a, yeah. an increase and then a, and then a decrease. Um, what we see in the time frame that we've measured is that we would have, um, you know, the, the sperm, when they're activated, there's a relatively quick response and that response is durable. So we don't see a shift back towards weak or immodal sperm um, when we've done that. And that's on human sperm. Um, so I don't think that we're, that we're observing that type of burnout necessarily. Okay, good. Do you think uh, you were talking, Dr. Aiken, about uh, the use of antioxidants? Um, can you expound on that a little bit? How long, which ones, and could we substitute uh, the use of them in vitro rather than just simply in vivo? Can we add them during the processing? Okay. So um, let's start with in vivo first. Uh, in vivo, really frustrating field. I mean, um, I have seen so many um, dollars wasted on clinical trials with antioxidants, where the strategy is to give all the patients antioxidants or to give patients with poor motility antioxidants, and nobody is selecting the patients on the basis of oxidative stress. It's like, uh, you know, every patient who comes into hospital in a coma, you give them all insulin. Well, you know, some, some will get better, <laughs> but some will die. And uh, you can't give a therapy in the absence of an appropriate diagnostic uh, selection procedure. So uh, I have, uh, and I declare interest here, I, I, uh, I, I, feel I, I receive no reward, but I am a colleague of uh, a friend of mine, um, Parvis, Parvis Gaia Goslu, who, who uh, is a very good formulation chemist, has put together an antioxidant formulation, which is, uh, I think, very powerful. And using that uh, GPX5 knockout mouse, which is a definitive oxidative stress model, right? So in that model, spermatogenesis, absolutely normal. Sperm go into the epididymis, GPX5 knocked out. They get oxidative DNA damage as they go through the epididymal lumen. And uh, the phenotype there is what you'd expect. You get poor motility and high rates of birth defect, but you can then completely reverse that phenotype if you put the animals on uh, antioxidant therapy. So in animal models, we can prove this works beautifully. I cannot convince any clinician so far to, uh, or any funding agency so far, to fund a human study where we select the patients on the basis of an oxidative stress marker 
I don't care if that's a lipid peroxide or oxidative DNA damage, but something. And then we see the ability of the antioxidants to reverse that. So my feeling is that, yeah, this should work, but it will only work if you select the patients appropriately. In vitro, um, the evidence is um, um, uh, very strong that in, for example, in domestic animal world, many people uh, and in some cases, uh, for literally decades, they've been including antioxidants like catalase in cryo storage media in order to prevent oxidative stress. And uh, antioxidants are very good at also keeping the egg alive. So, you know, egg and sperm have quite different lifestyles. The uh, uh, sperm, surprisingly, is, is designed to, for marathon racing especially in our species where ovulation and insemination are not coordinated. Uh, whereas the egg uh, lives fast and dies young. Um, but you can keep that egg going much longer if you put antioxidants in the medium. And the one that people have used very successfully is melatonin. So yes, I think antioxidants have a role in vivo and in vitro. We just uh, seem to uh, avoid doing the definitive clinical studies to demonstrate that this is effective in vivo and, uh, and in vitro. So are there things you think we should be doing to avoid inducing any more oxidative stress as we handle both eggs and sperm? Uh, well, you know, I think um, <clears throat> we, we've really covered some of that ground already. So um, if you want to avoid oxidative stress, just look at the things that uh, induce it. Uh, so they are the lifestyle factors, the obesity, the diet, um, chemical exposures, electromagnetic radiation exposures, a whole variety of different things will cause oxidative stress in the germline. So avoid those inducers would be one thing. And then, yes, I think there is room to um, uh, improve our in vitro culture media, both for spermatozoa and embryos, to uh, include antioxidants as a way of preserving the integrity of these cells. Um, they're just, um, what we need to do now are some systematic studies uh, in order to optimize which antioxidant we should include at what dose. Uh, because antioxidants are not one thing, you know, they, they attack the oxidative process at a variety of different points. And uh, we need to determine which is the most important one. Um, yeah, work still to be done. So Kathleen, it sounds like with multiple centrifugation steps and multiple treatment steps, this is probably not something you're recommending, even though it might be really applicable for uh, Tessie or Misa samples? So we, we have not tried on Tessie or Misa samples. I will say though that we, we have only one centrifugation step if somebody's doing the discontinuous gradient and we've designed the rest of the procedure to be additions as opposed to centrifuging and then resuspending. Oh, so after each one of the solutions, you don't centrifuge? No. Ah, I, I understood that. Yeah, that, that was something that, um, you know, as, as kind of an early uh, thought process for this, we didn't want to add in the additional stress to the cells um, or the additional time for the centrifugation step. So we've designed it to be, you know, the sperm cells are isolated, you put them in the first media, and then you add a volume of the priming reagent, and then you add a volume of the activating reagent. Got it. Um, so another question, um, oh, I, I'm not sure I can pronounce this person's name. Olafazo Seo Lee, what could be the effect of cancer on children if the woman smokes but the man does not? Could there be an increase in children's cancer uh, compared to if the woman smokes and the man does not? How do you start to pick all this apart? <laughs> well, well, clinical studies have been done and I'm no epidemiologist, but uh, my epidemiological friends tell me uh, and the, the papers uh, assert uh, that paternal smoking increases mutational load in the offspring, not maternal smoking. So it's, it's dad 
who is the, um, the source of most mutations that we see in our species. That's, uh, that's been known for some time. As I said, if there is a maternal component, it's that uh, little window where the, sp the egg has to repair the DNA damage, come in with the fertilizing sperm. And uh, uh, there is no evidence that I know of that the ability of the egg to repair DNA damage is compromised by exposure to cigarette smoke or the, 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 uh, the host, if you like, to cigarette smoke. Um, and certainly the epidemiological data shows strong correlations with uh, paternal smoking, but not with maternal smoking. So I think it's a dad phenomenon. So would you advocate for no ICSI? Uh, I think ICSI should be used um, really sparingly. Uh, I don't think it should be used um, um, as uh, the default technique. There's no evidence that it actually increases fertilization rates. And uh, there is um, a, an inherent risk in ICSI in the sense that uh, you have no capacity to really select um, the, uh, the best spermatozoon that you're now inserting into the egg. You're kind of bypassing all of the uh, basic biology that uh, keeps fertilization, the sort of um, protects the fertilization of the oocyte um, um, physiologically. So, uh, so yes, I would say uh, I wouldn't use it as a default technique. There are some cases of very severe male infertility where you have no option. So then I think it's a great technique to use. But if you uh, can use IVF, then why not use IVF? You at least get some measure of sperm selection in that process. All right. Um, and what about, oh, we, we did talk about um, uh, this whole using your process, Kathleen, with uh, Tessie. But do you also combine this? Would you recommend combining your process with, um, say, DNA fragmentation assessments? Um, so are you asking the, if, if... As a treatment plan for the, the man, do DNA fragmentation as well as, as your um, sperm processing? Or are you saying, are you, is your general recommendation to do this processing for everyone? Um, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, great to see the clinical data. <laughs> Because that, that also will obviously impact that. I mean, when we're just, the data that we have looking at sperm suggests that this is something that could provide benefit to um, most men. So assuming that there is sperm in the ejaculate and this is something that could improve their opportunity to, to um, fertilize and uh, have, a, a, have a, an embryo available for transfer and then also to have a baby but obviously that's something that um you know that that'll be uh supported by the clinical data that we have coming um as we we have not just by looking at the sperm motility phenotypes we haven't necessarily identified a specific subpopulation that would benefit most. And again, I think this is something that, you know, having the outcomes from the clinical study will, very, will be very informative for. Okay. I think if I could interject there, um, that fertilization and DNA damage are two very important factors, but they're rather separate factors in the sense that uh, DNA damaged sperm can fertilize an egg. So if fertilization and pregnancy is your readout you wouldn't necessarily see a strong correlation between DNA damage and pregnancy outcomes. Um, but you might if you then looked at uh, the mutational load carried by the offspring. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the problems with the field is that people look at this very simplistically and they think there should be a correlation between DNA damage in the male gamete and pregnancy outcomes at the other end. It's not about pregnancy outcomes. It's about the quality of the embryos you, you produce and the mutational load that they're carrying. Whereas Kathleen's uh, approach is to ensure fertilization, which is a completely different phenomenon. And, um, you know, in the perfect world, we would try to ensure that when fertilization occurs, it occurs between gametes that are carrying the minimal amount of DNA damage. All right. Well, on that note, um, I'm being encouraged to uh, wrap up.
So I want to thank both of you. It was, it was a lovely presentation on both your parts. And thank you for spending time with us and answering all of these questions. I'd also like to thank all the participants for um, attending and participating in this discussion. And thank you to, I mean, a lot of thanks go out to the organizing committee of this group, Dr. Jacques Cohen, Dr. Peter Naj, Thomas Elliott, Shaista Sadrudin, the groups behind the scenes, the people behind the scenes, um, Allison Bartolucci. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. This is, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on to put this on. I would like to encourage all of you to, in the audience, to contact uh, the International IVF Initiative if you would like to help or create web content or have a topic you would like to, to present. And with that, we will end this session and thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you.